In the next few lectures, we'll be turning to 20th century philosophy and its divisions. However, before we do that, we have, there's one more piece of the late 19th and early 20th century we need to consider. These are influences on philosophy from outside philosophy, from the new emerging social sciences. Now, we've already seen in the 17th century how philosophy was utterly dependent on and deeply affected by the physical sciences, physics in particular. We've also seen how Darwin, and hence the biological sciences, made an enormous impact on philosophy, an impact we'll still be charting as time goes on, in the middle of the 19th century. But now, in the late 19th century, the fields of psychology and sociology are splitting off from philosophy and establishing their own disciplines. And in particular, much of the work they're doing, or at least some of their practitioners doing, is tremendously important for 20th century philosophy. So <clears throat> one of these two impacts comes from virtually all the classic sociological theorists of the late 19th century, like Ferdinand Tönnies, Max Weber, Emile Durkheim, and Henry Summer Maine all who tried to describe the difference between the new modern society and traditional society. In fact, you might almost say that the field of sociology was invented in order to try to solve that problem, to distinguish the modern from the traditional. On the other hand, in psychology, there was a particularly radical Viennese doctor whose psychological theories shocked the world. Now, in this lecture, we'll focus on two figures whose work was widely influential in the 20th century. The first is Max Weber, the sociologist, and the second, obviously, the Viennese doctor, is Sigmund Freud. In the portion of their work that we will focus on here, they ask the question, what are the maladies that are coming to oppress Western peoples in their utterly novel, modern way of life? In each case, they raise the question, what is the cost of this new life of freedom, equality, and unending progress in a world without traditions? We will see that each has his own rather disturbing answer. Freud's in terms of the deep psychological implications of the personal control, the control over the self, required by modern society, and Weber's cost in terms of the institutions necessary for a rational, free, and equal society. We'll begin with Freud. Sigmund Freud was a medical doctor and psychiatrist, not an historian, but his theory of human nature had enormous impact and in his interpretations of the history of human nature as well. Even if today his work is rarely accepted at face value as scientific fact. His early work was on hysterical patients who exhibited muscular paralysis with apparently no organic basis. But his first work of genius was the 1900 On the Interpretation of Dreams. And this argued that dreams revealed the workings of an unconscious mind which drove consciousness. Now, what did his theory hold? First, our consciousness is not all there is to our mind. Consciousness is one system in the mind, but there is an unconscious mind. And in that unconscious mind, are, there are particularly the energies driven by instincts, and especially by sex. Freud shocked the world by claiming that even infants have a rudimentary form of sexual desire. The ego or self must while trying to deal with reality, which of course everyone knows it must do, the ego or self has to deal with reality. But Freud pointed out it must simultaneously have to defend itself from two inner enemies, or at least uh, uh, competitors, the instincts from the unconscious on the one hand, which are, which are attacking conscious, attacking the ego, trying to get the ego to do things, and the superego. The superego is simply the internalized sensorial voice 
of our parents. Now the instincts that fuel our lives and are in a sense the basis for everything are dangerous to the ego. The ego has to resist them through a variety of defense mechanisms while expressing them in sublimated or displaced forms. The centerpiece of personality formation in Freud's theory f lay in the famous Oedipal complex for boys and the female version, the Electra complex for girls. Without going into any detail, I'll just say that in each of these dynamic situations, the young child wants to possess, sexually possess the opposite sexed parent, hence fears the aggression of the same sex parent. This fear creates an unbearable tension in the child, which is reconciled by identifying with the imagined aggressor, the same sexed parent. That's the way the infant's mind overcomes the fear, is by identifying with the person that is the object of the fear. And this, Freud claimed, forms the basis for the child's properly sexed adult identity. Now, let's speak a little bit more generally. Freud was no libertine. There is nothing in Freud that suggests we ought to let our instincts run free. From Freud's point of view, the instincts are necessary and are dangerous. Repression of instincts is a necessity. The problem is, if the repression of the instincts, if the ego's tactics in dealing with the instincts bubbling up from within are too severe because of unfavorable environmental conditions, if the repression is too great or takes a bizarre form, then neurotic illness results. And Freud's business as a therapist was to try to trace back a neurotic symptom, like someone who's continually washing their hands because they're terrified of some kind of pollution, to start with that symptom and find out what instinct is being blocked, how it's being blocked, and how that instinct could now be expressed and gratified in a socially acceptable manner. The general picture that Freud gave us, and this is what's most important from a philosophical point of view, Freud's picture is of the human psyche in permanent conflict. So the ego is bombarded by instincts from the unconscious, it is attacked by guilt from the superego, and of course it still has to deal with the real world, which causes its own troubles. So the ego is in a sphere that's full of conflict. What this also means for Freud, and in this way, he's very similar to Schopenhauer and to Nietzsche. Freud was convinced of the, shall we say, the low origin of all high human activities. That is, our cultural activities are sublimations of base instincts. What he means, for example, is the painter expressing what look like lofty, beautiful visions on the canvas is in fact trying to satisfy a sexual urge that can't be satisfied in any other way. Or certainly the avid sportsman who tries to engage in uh, a game or a sport where they win game after game they are satisfying in a socially acceptable, sublimated, refined way the instincts of aggression. Now, later in his career, after the horrors of the First World War, Freud posited a, or came upon a much greater in, uh, impulse than sex for him. He, Freud posited an instinct of aggression that could rival sexuality. Earlier in his career, he'd recognized that the ego has some kind of urge to preserve itself. But after having experienced the horrors of the First World War, which again, from a European perspective, was completely unprecedented, an unprecedented slaughter, Freud began to believe that human beings must have an innate impulse to violence or more broadly and philosophically put, to tear holes, structures apart into their most basic elements, to reduce things to rubble in a certain sense. Now in one of his last books, Civilization and Its Discontents, 
he made just this type of argument. Freud claimed that the growth of civilization must bring with it an ever-increasing sense of unhappiness due to guilt. Now that may sound bizarre. Why would that be? The reason is that as civilization advances, it requires more and more complete suppression of our instincts. In other words, as we become more civilized, we control our sexual desires and, uh, for example, binding them within marriage, or at least we're supposed to, and we re so we restrict our sexual lives into a socially acceptable manner, but even more so, we're supposed to suppress our aggressive instincts into very con uh, small controlled outlets. Now, the more organized and pacific society becomes, and the more peaceful society is, the more aggression must be being repressed to produce that outcome. The unconscious psyche, however, remains aware of the now unfulfilled, hence more troublesome, aggressive instincts. This awareness causes the superego to generate guilt, which means to redirect the aggression toward the self. What Freud is claiming is that even as we control ourselves more successfully, we feel more guilty, for we cannot hide our now ever more unsatisfied instinctual impulses from our own minds. We feel guilty over the unfulfilled aggressive wishes, even as we become more pacific in outward behavior. What Freud's literally saying is that the saint is racked with guilt because the saint represses all aggressive instincts. The mind cannot hide those aggressive wishes from itself and generates more and more guilt over those unfulfilled aggressive energies that build up and build up and build up. But the great blow of Freud's overall work, understood philosophically, is above all against the self-image of 19th century Victorian man, who was increasingly master of nature, of science, and if you take into account European imperialism in the 19th century, at its high watermark, the late 19th century, Victorian man was increasingly master of the world, the geopolitical world as well. But with all this mastery, the Victorian man is not master in his own soul. That is, the modern person is not in control of the deepest parts of him or herself. The irrational will, of which Schopenhauer and Nietzsche both spoke, lies at the heart of humanity's most refined achievements. And that irrational piper must and will be paid. Again, for Freud, this doesn't mean simply uh, running through the fields and joining a hippie commune where there is free sex. Uh, it doesn't mean simply opening oneself to the satisfaction of one's instincts but it means the necessity of finding a balance between expression and repression or control. And he feels we are becoming more and more imbalanced in that regard. Now we turn to Maximilian Karl Emil Weber. Weber was one of the great German sociologists who tried to account for the development direction of the modern world. Whereas Marx found his example of advanced capitalism in England, Weber found it in the United States, which he toured. So just as we can think of Marx, who we saw in an earlier lecture, as a kind of sociologist with his own explanation of the modern world, because it was a very specific, historically materialist economic explanation, now we're seeing Weber, who does not give an economic interpretation of the world, although he's very familiar with economics, but a more purely sociological explanation of uh, modernity. Now, his most famous claim, Weber's most famous claim about modernization is that it is a process of rationalization, by which he meant the differentiation of activities into discrete contexts with their old with their own instrumental goals and presuppositions, and the rational improvement of activities 
in terms of their efficiency or productivity. Right? He argued this in his most famous book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, where he tried to point out that capitalism in the 18th and 19th centuries evolved and thrived in Protestant countries where Calvinism had made world, worldly accomplishment a sign of membership in God's elect, rather than in Catholic countries, which in the Catholic tradition, there was no indication that wealth had any spiritual importance. Now let's back up for a moment and see what this means, this notion of rationalizing, differentiating, uh, and rationally improving activities. Suppose I live in, suppose I live in a, uh, well, in a traditional village, and in our village of, uh, in which we mostly engage in subsistence agriculture and maybe some hunting and gathering on the side, uh, we have a particular way of irrigating our crops. And when the season begins and we open the sluice gates and begin to irrigate for certain key crops, we have religious ceremonies and perhaps there is a priest or a, or a medicine man who participates in these ceremonies. For us, the religious ceremony, the, uh, uh, the opening of the sluice gates, this whole acti is, activity is one integrated whole. But suppose someone comes along and says, wait a second, there's a more efficient way to irrigate the crops than this. In order for us to adopt that more efficient way, we have to break up the old tradition. We have to say to ourselves, ah, the point of all this is just to grow more crops. It has nothing to do with our relationship to God. It has nothing to do with our relationship to each other and performance of ceremonies. You split out of this complex activity, you take one piece and say, this piece to be improved, we must apply rational, efficient processes to it. That kind of breakup of traditional activities is what he means by rationalization. Now along with this, in uh, his book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, what Weber meant to say about Protestantism is this, that modern Protestantism, and remember Protestantism is a modern invention, Protestant Reformation begins in 1516, as a reaction against Roman Catholicism, Protestantism, he says, created what Weber calls an inner weltlich askese, inner worldly asceticism. Asceticism, the attempt to give up pleasures and live uh, the life of a monk, so to speak. So the Protestant ethic brought about this attitude of inner worldly asceticism, which from Weber's point of view was extremely novel in the history of the world. It is very hard to find among traditional societies people who say that work is good in itself. Work is necessary, but it isn't good in itself. A this-worldly asceticism in Protestantism says it's morally good and beloved of God to go to the office in the morning, work hard, produce more, and create more money, and not consume it because that's selfish and that's hedonistic but to build and consume, uh, build and uh, produce more and more through one's effort is somehow beloved of God. So this is an asceticism, but it's not otherworldly. It's not like Buddhist asceticism focused on a different world. It's focused on this world. All right. But as time wore on, Weber said, the religious motivation was dropped in an increasingly secular world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. This led to a form of ever-increasing personal self-control for the sole purpose of accumulation, independent of religious or social meaning. So again, what happens is the activities of modern life begin integrated with religious, cultural, traditional influences, but then to efficiently approve the activities so that they become more and more productive at less cost, you have to break up or leave behind that complex social nexus and focus just on the activity itself and, in, and practical improvements to it. So in modernity, along with this, according to Weber, 
authority changes from charismatic and traditional to bureaucratic. Uh, charismatic authority, uh, uh, traditional authority is easy to understand. It's simply the authority that existed in past society of uh, parents over children, of the village chief or head over others, the council of elders over the rest of the tribe, etc. Charismatic authority, by that Weber means there are unique individuals in history who simply exude a kind of authority. His example would be Jesus Christ. But modern society has to be run by bureaucratic authority. Why? Bureaucracy is necessary to individual equality. Weber is pointing out that with the equality and freedom of modern life, there must go certain kinds of institutions. For example, we all complain about being treated bureaucratically when we go to the Department of Motor Vehicles. We wait in the line for half an hour, we get to the front, and we suddenly discover that uh, we've left one form behind. And the, the officious person behind the desk says, uh, uh, you just have to start over, go to another line, and, and uh, come back later. We would wish that what we might, we might prefer is that the woman behind the desk is actually a re relative or a friend who says, well, listen, don't worry about it. We can fill that form out later. Just give me the fee now, etc." If she were to do that, she would be violating equality. She would be treating us personally. She would be doing what, in fact, in many third world countries we call corruption, letting someone of her clan get ahead in line, etc. So in other words, if we're going to be free and equal and treated the same, we have to organize society through bureaucracy. Weber says there's simply no other choice. Now, in a famous essay by Weber called Science as a Vocation, he makes a very, very interesting argument. Weber claims that in the modern age, with human activity organized not by an overarching religious tradition, you see, we were, we're about half a generation beyond Nietzsche here, and so Weber isn't staying up late night worrying about the death of God, as Nietzsche was, but he is in effect saying society is becoming secularized. For him, that's a matter of fact, okay, to be noted rather than an issue to be fought over. So in our society, a modern society, our activity is organized not by an overarching religious tradition, but instead by instrumental rationality and bureaucracy. Instrumental rationality simply means the kind of rationality you use when you try to get most efficiently from A to B. When I say I'm hungry and I want food as quickly as possible, if I then, instead of walking to the store to get food, turn around and go off to listen to music, that's irrational in an instrumental sense. I'm not doing what makes most sense to accomplish the goals that I've announced. So instrumental rationality and bureaucracy become the ways that humans accomplish things collectively in a modern, capitalist, scientifically oriented society. What this means for Weber is that human values are, as he says, polytheistic. A strange word to apply to a secularized society. Polytheistic for Weber means we have no way to integrate the ultimate meanings or ends or goals of life. Those ultimate ends or goals are now in competition and we must simply choose among them. In other words, do you wish to be the great, a great parent of your children? Do you wish to be a famous statesman, member of the community? Do you wish to be uh, a great follower of your own religion? Do you wish to be rich? Do you wish to be handsome? All these are different goals. Do you want to uh, enjoy life hedonistically, lay on a beach in Barbados uh, and, uh, and drink uh, Cuba Libras? If you wish to do any of these things, you must simply choose one or the other. They can't be integrated, okay? Uh, one has to make a choice. Now, Weber gave a striping example of this. Uh, again, one of the pleasures of reading Weber is his experience in America. <clears throat> Having traveled to Chicago and other cities in the U.S., Weber gave this example. He said, 
Let's compare the German student. This is about in the first decade of the, of the 20th century. Let's compare a German student with the American student. And all these students that, hit, that he saw were males. So he says, compare the German and the American boy. He says, the American boy learns unspeakably less than the German boy. <laughs> in other words, the German schools force the German boy to learn far more. But there's a further reason for this. The reason the German student learns more is that he believes the professor is initiating him into an entire Weltanschauung, that is a world view. What the German student says to his professor is, Professor, you are wise. You live at a different status in society than I do. Take me up into your world. Teach me how to live in that world. Give me a whole different worldview and a way of living. In other words, the German, and consequently, the German student places an enormous value on the education he's receiving. What about the American boy? He says, the American boy says to the teacher, sell me your knowledge for my father's money, as if he were buying a cabbage. In other words, the American boy is, uh, what, a pragmatist who simply wants the techniques and the information the teacher knows so that he can then go off and make money with it. Now, certainly, one way of describing this difference is to say that the German boy has placed a, places a tremendous value on education, and the American boy is some kind of a Philistine who really doesn't care about learning. But Weber, the brilliant Weber, says, yes, that's true. But the other side of the situation, for Weber, every silver lining has a cloud around it. Weber uh, adds to this, the American boy is intrinsically anti-authoritarian. The American boy will never look at the teacher as someone who can tell him how to live or who to vote for. The German boy, on the other hand, is essentially asking the teacher to tell him how to live. So the American boy is more individually free than the German boy. He also learns less. That's the bargain. Progress, while some take it to provide meaning, Weber argues, actually undermines meaning. This is still continuing with his essay um, uh, on uh, uh, science as a vocation. The biblical Abraham, uh, Weber says, could die satiated with life, having done everything that a man of his time could do. But today's scientist or athlete or architect must know that those who will follow will destroy and or improve his or her achievements. I build a building today, everybody loves it. 20 years from now, they tear it down because they love something else more. The rational, scientific, economic approach, the individuality and equality and material progress, that is all these, th these characteristics of modern civilization we prize so highly come at a price. And the price is, and he's happy to use a word Marx used, although in a different way, alienation. Freedom and equality mean, as the Weberian sociologist Peter Berger later put it, a permanent identity crisis. The absence of a fixed social status leaves the indi individual's identity up for grabs. When I was a medieval peasant 500 years ago, I had no freedom, but there was no question who I was. I was the child of my father and my mother. I was a Roman Catholic living in a town, and I would never leave it. I had a job to do, which was whatever job my father did, and that's who I was. Now, as a modern person, I am free, but that also means I could go virtually anywhere, take virtually any job, move out of one situation, leave my family and never see them again. Freedom means a permanent identity crisis. So, the combination of instrumental rationality and the urge to ever greater efficiency with bureaucratic structures, now increasingly without the earlier Protestant religious justification, Weber likened this whole situation to living in an iron cage. He called us, quote, specialists without spirit, sensualists without heart. This nullity imagines that it has attained a level of civilization never before achieved, unquote. Well, that's a pretty nasty thing to say. How to respond? Weber thought there were only two options for someone living in the modern age and who is awake to what's going on. 
The options were, in his words, bear the fate of the times like a man, in other words, live freely with alienation, or as he said, return to the open arms of the old churches. In other words, go back to a communal and religious existence that would tell you what to think and what to do. Now what happened to the thought of these thinkers? Well, Freud's views were taken up immediately by the French existentialists. Uh, psychoanalysis cohered nicely with their concep conception that the self is alienated in contemporary society. Likewise, uh, the German critical theorists of the Frankfurt School, who we will see later, combined Freud with Marx, even though psychoanalysis is, from an orthodox Marxist point of view, a bourgeois science. Weber's thought was taken up by a number of thinkers, not as prominently, but by a number of thinkers in continental philosophy, particularly Jürgen Habermas and some of the postmodernists that we'll see much later in the course. The reason is that Weber's message was that modernity brings fragmentation into practical contexts of instrumental rationality. Okay? And postmodernism is all about the idea of fragmentation or loss of unity. So for both Freud and Weber, modern science, equality, freedom, and endless progress, however good they are, bring with them a cost, guilt, bureaucratic control, and alienation. In modernity, every silver lining has a cloud around it. We may say that they put the final nails in the lid of Hegelian optimism. For that optimism, all human powers could be successfully integrated into a whole. And from Freud, the point of view in Freud and Weber, that possibility is a pipe dream.